Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us this lunchtime. Now, I suspect that a number of you joining us this afternoon have joined us before, but if so, you'll be familiar with the format. If you're new to our format this afternoon, a very warm welcome to you. Those of you who've been here before, do bear with us whilst I take a few moments to welcome the new people. We know that it takes everyone a few minutes to settle in and to make some tea and test your speakers working, all that kind of thing. So whilst you're doing that, I'm going to pop on a short film to set the scene for this afternoon. So I'll pop that on and be back with you in a couple of minutes. The creation of HS2 is the biggest infrastructure project in Europe. The first new intercity railway to be built north of London in over a century. HS2 is being built in two phases. Phase 1 will link London and the West Midlands and is due to be completed by 2026. In Phase 2, the line will extend to Crewe by 2027 and followed by new lines towards Manchester and Leeds by 2033. But before we build bridges, tunnels, tracks and stations, an unprecedented amount of archaeological work will take place along the line of the route. HS2's archaeology programme is the largest ever undertaken in the UK. This once-in-a-generation opportunity allows us to reveal over 10,000 years of British history. Come with us as we take a train through time. Our journey starts a long time ago in the Paleolithic period, where early ancestors roamed in groups hunting and gathering food, then settled and learned how to farm and discovered the secrets of making bronze and iron. We will then travel forward in time to see the mark the Romans left on Britain. From their straight roads and new systems of government to sanitation and town planning. Following the departure of the Romans, we head into medieval Britain. We'll see the effect the Black Death had on villages, towns and cities and gain insight into how critical battles in the Wars of the Roses unfolded. The final leg of our journey takes us to the Industrial Revolution, where the landscape and infrastructure of Britain saw dramatic changes. Factories were built and the economy grew. In the 19th century, the steam rail network revolutionised how we moved goods and people across the country. In the 21st century, HS2 gives us a chance to do so again, creating a fairer, more balanced and prosperous Britain. Using the skills and expertise of an unprecedented number of archaeologists, all artefacts and human remains will be treated with the dignity, care and respect they deserve. And all discoveries will be shared with communities, retelling the stories of our past, helping us understand what made us as a country. The sheer scale of possible discoveries, the geographical span, and the vast range of our history to be unearthed makes HS2's archaeology programme a unique opportunity to tell the story of Britain, whilst leaving a lasting legacy for generations to come. So, thank you very much to everyone for joining us this afternoon. My name is Sam Fieldhouse. I'm Community and Education Manager for Wessex Archaeology. So it looks about like 60% of you are all here for the first time, which is fantastic. So thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. For the 40 or percent of you who are joining us again, thank you very much for making time to come and join in with our session this afternoon. So in a few minutes, I'll be joined by my colleague Emma and some esteemed guests to discuss Curzon Street, Railway Mania and the Grand Junction Railway. So without further ado, I shall introduce our team today. So your team this afternoon, you have Anthony Cools, who is Senior Curator of Rail Transport at the National Railway Museum. My colleague Emma Carter, who is an industrial archaeologist. We have John Millwood, who is Head of Heritage for HS2. And we have Dr David Gwynne, who is a railway historian. And I thought we'd start this session with each of our experts saying a few words about what this idea of Curzon Street and Victorian railway mania means to them. So I will unmute the microphones of all our guest speakers today. And I will ask them to say a few words. 
And David, do you want to kick us off? What does this session, what interests you? What does the archaeology at Curzon Street mean to you? Well, uh, you've been called in uh, to give some advice and some historical context, particularly on the, the locomotive shed uh, that's being discovered at Curzon Street. And I have a particular interest in the, the early evolution of railways. Railways have been around in the United States kingdom since probably the 16th century but what we see in the 19th century as the the initial video showed and as Curzon Street its archaeology itself confirms is of course that there was there was a very considerable change in these early years um, from very short horse-drawn mineral lines might run from a colliery down to navigable water to the sort of mainline railway that we're seeing in Birmingham so for me, I'm looking at archaeological evidence of a very interesting change in a particular type of technology. Thank you for that, David. And John, what about you? Okay, for me, it's a fantastic opportunity to really connect with those early pioneers of the mainland railway era, particularly the Stevensons on this side. And also, obviously, we've got the rather exciting juxtaposition of an 1830s innovative station with a 21st century innovative station that we're obviously designing at the moment. Brilliant, thank you very much. And Anthony, now we have had, Anthony's in deepest, darkest Yorkshire, so we've had some problems with his internet, but Anthony, are you there? Yeah, I'm even further than that, I'm actually in County Durham, Sam. But uh, Curzon Street, to me, um, I'm an expat Midlander. I, I was brought up in Warwickshire and knew Curzon Street from a small boy. Uh, I was taken there in the late 1970s to see some of the National Railway uh, collection of catering vehicles on display there. And it always seemed a bit odd, you know, why was this, this stone building standing in great isolation at the end of a parcels depot in the middle of Brum? So to understand it now and to be able to look at the archaeology and meld it in with the plans, I'm able to understand a lot more about the workings of a inner city railway terminus, because bear in mind this was a terminus, and, the, and the, the, how, how the whole system came together but operated on the ground, you know, you can look at plans, you can read books, you can read accounts, but to actually see something on the ground gives that extra level of understanding, which is why the project's so exciting for me. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for that, Anthony. So we're going to talk now a little about the archaeology of the site, so we know what we're starting from. And as I say, my colleague at Wessex, Emma, is an industrial archaeologist. Emma, can you tell us a little bit about the archaeology, please? I can, yeah. So, like Sam said, my background is in industrial archaeology, but also I am passionate about the literature and the art of the period, so I do expect some of those veins of interest coming together and pulling in our interest about the site. So, bombed, blasted and black with coal, Birmingham has been the resilient, roaring heart of the Industrial Revolution in the Midlands. Even today, those arterial spurs of the motorways and train lines flood into the city still, reasserting its importance in manufacturing and engineering. Now, when I take the train from Sheffield to Birmingham, I find myself gazing out the window in those final few moments before the train arrives in Birmingham New Street Station. I look at all the mix of buildings and I wonder how many of you have also looked at that gaze as you go along into New Street Station and been struck by the imposing, brutal block of Victorian architecture, the fantastic principal building at Curzon Street. The archaeological results at Curzon Street have pulled in our 21st century gaze as the press, public and even the Prime Minister were drawn to the evocative comparisons of Victorian railway mania and HS2. It's likely that you've seen the brilliant images of the confusingly named uh, but appropriate roundhouse in the news, accompanied by modern railway mania in a beautiful circularity of new railway scheme revealing the remains of an old one. But as we look at the excavation results at Curzon Street, I want to show you that the bricks and mortar are more than the structures they once were. They exemplify the social fears, hopes and changes that came with the Industrial Revolution and also those revolutionary changes that, that happened to passenger railways that brought about difference to the way we enjoyed our free time, leisure, food and travel and even of the freshness of our fish and chips. So industrial archaeology is very, very different to rural archaeology. When we read features on rural sites, we often find ourselves looking at interconnecting ditches, phases of pits, and sometimes, if we're lucky, 
will even glimpse those post holes which might whisper of structures long since lost to time. We investigate all of these features with the aim of piecing together any clues about who lived there and how long ago. Pottery evidence can often become one of the best ways to contextualise those dates of those features, but also we can use the features purpose to help build a picture of the past. We can look at the fills, the deposits and the overall shape to give clues about what it actually was doing in the landscape. Now, often in rural sites, we look at the earliest seeds of agriculture being sown into that land. So when we piece all these elements together to make reconstructions of prehistoric sites, we can only look at the remains of that these people left behind. Their voices and identity can sometimes be lost and as ephemeral as the archaeological results that we are looking at. But for industrial archaeology, we have so much more. It's not just the bricks and the mortar that we can look at, but accurate maps and plans, first person voices, satirical cartoons, political pamphlets, and of course, the literature and art of the 19th century. So you can go online, you can go into a bookshop and pick up a copy of Hard Times and relive that relentless oppression of working in an industrial mill. Or perhaps you might pick up Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and delve into the fear that science and the Industrial Revolution were eclipsing the natural order of all things godly or otherwise. Now, even in Dracula, Stoker heightens the tensions of moving away from the developed West into the barbarian East by increasing the terrifying devolution of transport on Harker's journey. From the trains to the horse-drawn carriages and finally on foot, the more primitive the form of transport, the greater Harker's danger. Now, just as Bram Stoker uses the roaring power of steam and industry as a gauge of societal evolution, so too does the Franco-British painter Philip James de Lutherberg. Now, interested in the Industrial Revolution, de Lutherberg painted Colbrook Dale by Night in 1801. It hangs today in the Science Museum and remains one of the most iconic images of Industrial Revolution. Whilst the image was painted many years before the platform and tracks at Curzon Street, it does still manage to encapsulate the social and economic impacts of the Industrial Revolution. So set within the steep hills of Ironbridge Gorge in Shropshire, some 26 miles northwest of Birmingham, what should be an image of romantic rural life is blistered apart by the roaring fires of Maidley Wood furnaces. That was also known as Bedlam Furnaces due to its rather sinister appearance and the power of these fires upsets that velvet night that the Lutherberg paints and threatens to break a new industrial dawn. The Lutherberg is showing here that these almost hellish looking furnaces challenged nature supremacy and as the demand for iron increased with the rise and dominance of railways, we know that that landscape was forever changed. Railways and industry are used in 19th century art and literature as beacons for society's goodness or badness, depending on your view of the Industrial Revolution and what it did to society. The Industrial Revolution was perhaps the poison and the cure for people of 19th century Britain, and those tendrils, tendrils of technological progress affected every single aspect of Victorian life. So in order to discuss and understand the impacts of the railway at Curzon Street, we must include these with, with these wider impacts when we look at these remains here. So the Curzon Street site is of such great significance because it is the location of the first railway passenger terminus to serve the centre of Birmingham. This would have changed everything for people who could afford to travel. No longer limited to the smoky confines of the back-to-backs, these passengers could experience their very own grand day out. Curzon Street was the terminus for both the London and Birmingham Railway and the Grand Junction Railway. Now, the London and Birmingham Railway opened first in 1838 and was the first railway journey that joined London to a major provincial city. Now, from the outset, it was envisaged that the site would be shared by both companies, but the London and Birmingham Railway were a little bit sneaky. So as the primary developers, they had a head start and used the site to their best advantage, leaving a rather awkwardly shaped triangular parcel of land for the Grand Junction Railway. When it did eventually open, the Grand Junction Railway uh, occurred in 1839 with the lines connecting to Manchester and Liverpool. The two companies had adjacent parallel platforms, but no through services were provided. Now, the principal building, the three-storey classical building that we see on the site today, was designed by the London and Birmingham Railway architect Philip Hardwick. As part of the original design, the building was to be flanked by two arches leading into the station. 
Harbick actually planned the intended use for each and every room, but the path of the construction for the site was a rocky one and it faced many changes and revisions. Even after it was built, we'll see that those revisions took place. Now, the Times of April 1838 recorded in anticipation of the opening that the ground floor would have a refreshment saloon approach from the arrival side. So this seems to have taken over the space of the planned traffic office. In 1839, Hardwick prepared an estimate for the conversion of the boardroom for further refreshment space. The building thus adapted was called first the Victoria Hotel, then the Queen's Hotel, though the word hotel here is quite misleading and it refers only to the provision of refreshment. But in 1841, customers got their way and a wing was added to the north of the principal building, which did include three floors of bedrooms, together with additional space for refreshment on the ground floor. But even this wasn't enough to placate the demanding needs of an ever increasing amount of passengers. The situation of the station and the hotel, roughly a mile from the centre of Birmingham, was seen as a disadvantage. And in 1846, an Act of Parliament was passed for the Grand Central Station. This has become known as New Street Station. Now, by 1854, all services had been directed away from Curzon Street and the hotel closed in the same year. The site was then converted to become the London and North Western Railway Goods Depot, and the site's proximity to Lidworth Canal once again proved useful. This work was completed in 1865, and the principal building and its hotel wing served as offices for the goods station. Little subsequently changed on its site until its closure in 1966. Since its closure, it faced incendiary bombs during the Second World War, threats of demolition in the 70s, and a spout of restoration by Birmingham City Council, City Council in the early 70s and 80s, and then last year as an office in 2003. So what did we find? Now, the extensive remains of the former stations were uncovered at the very shallow depths below ground surface. In some areas, just 25 centimetres below that top slab of concrete. The nature of the remains took the form of brick wall foundations of former buildings and structures and deposits relating to various phases of demolition works. Evidence for the railway tracks was also identified and at least two phases of the former station were evident. Where the remains of the London and Birmingham Railway roundhouses could be seen, they were overlain by later tracks leading to the main goods shed of the later station dating to after 1854. The archaeology identified in the trial trenches correlated closely to the buildings shown on historic plans of the site, and most of the structural remains could be related to specific former buildings and structures. Now, the mitigation built upon earlier archaeological works and revealed the extent and survival of the structures across the site, especially in terms of below ground structures such as basements, wall foundations and turntable bases. Now, in industrial archaeology, those are the remains that often are preserved due to the way um, buildings update and are, and are constructed. So the assessment of bricks and metalwork recovered from the site may grant us further opportunity to address some of our research objectives, possibly indicating any local brick and metalworks or trades contributing to the expansion of the station over time. Now, phases of the development of the station were also very clearly evident. And this was particularly clear with the good station grain shed, which utilised parts of the earlier Grand Junction Railway Station offices. So the turntables of the good stations were particularly well preserved examples as well. The mitigation has confirmed that the extent, survival and relationships with structures across the site, especially regarding the wall and turntable foundations, giving us an insight into the evolution of turntables across the site between different phases of use, as well as changes in the use and construction of the buildings. So this increasing reliance on the railway of transport to goods is suggested by the evidence of expansion of the station and its conversion from a passenger terminal to a goods station. The work here provides an excellent opportunity to explore the link between railways and canals, and also to look at the way that passengers affected the railway journeys itself. So one of our last slides, Sam, if you could bring up that lovely plate for me, please. Brilliant. So this, this plate is very, very important. When we dig up sites, we often look at 19th century um, sort of pottery and think, oh, my nan had that in a cupboard. It's not very interesting, but let's take a closer look. The important thing, about this uh, bit of uh, pottery here, this plate, is that it has the branding of the London and Birmingham Railway on there. So it thought that this plate could possibly represent one of the first railway cafes and restaurants. 
So that's a rough summary of the results so far at the Curzon Street site. So over to you, Sam. That's great. Thank you very much, Emma. Now, as Emma said, one of the joys of, of uh, recent and contemporary archaeology is that we're able to scour the archives to find evidence as well as looking in the ground. So very shortly, I'm going to bring up some archive material and we're going to have a look at some of the amazing archive material that is available for us to use. So I'll bring some of those up now. Perfect. And I'm going to ask at this point, David, can you jump in here? Because we've talked about the archaeology and we've talked a bit about 19th century culture. And I want to kind of nail down this phrase railway mania. So, David, can you tell us a little bit about railway mania? Yes, I can. Um, now, uh, what's the date of the map we're looking at here, Sam? So we're um, looking here at, this is Smith's railway map of 1836. Fine. So that shows the uh, the beginnings of a national railway network. Now, I don't think by any means all of those railways actually existed by 1836. I think we're looking at some proposals here as well. But if you look at the, the top right hand corner of the map, you'll see there's quite a strong network of railways in the, the northeast um, around Newcastle, County Durham. Now, these were the, the historic heartlands of the railway as we know it, and these are still fairly short lines. They're doing the, the business of connecting mainly collieries with water, but you can see that one is already sneaking its way over to the western side of England, and other much longer, much more ambitious systems are being built, which are connecting London with big provincial towns. Now, from the late 1830s on, this was the era of the railway mania. There'd been a canal mania before that in the late 18th, early 19th century. But by the mid 1830s, it was clear that it was the railway that was going to become the national integrated transport system. So that's what we're looking at here, the beginnings of a national railway network. And Moving here on, so this is now Chefin's map of 1845 from the archives of the National Railway Museum. Anthony, did you want to say a few words about this one? What you can see here is um, you know, the, the organic growth and people beginning to establish connectivity. As, as David quite rightly said, their previous map, uh, Smith's from the 1830s, has uh, a number of uh, putative schemes where people have almost drawn a straight line between A to B and said this is what we're going to do here. Um, but in that 10 years, 1836-1846, you see a huge number, a huge growth of, um, of, of schemes to begin to create that organic network. Because bear in mind, each of these railways has to have an act of parliament passed to authorise its, its uh, creation. And so people have to invest in surveys, they have to invest in engineers coming to, to look at the routes and, and they're going to put money up front. And um, now by 1846, uh, I think 1846 alone, there were 272 acts put to Parliament to authorise railway construction and the majority of them got through. Uh, but it, you look at the amount of work that is necessary not just on a legislatory point of view, that point of angle, but you know the the engineers, the contractors. It's a serious undertaking, and railway mania is is quite something. You've got people promoting it, you've got people backing it, you've got um, a lot of money floating around, and um, and really, yeah, by the 1840s, you have the basis of the network as we know it, but also the springboard for. Um, you know, the, the growth of private capital uh, with promoters such as, as George Hudson, the, uh, the, the infamous railway king of York, who um, you know, rose to such spectacular heights in the promotion and construction of railways. And, and, and you know, where we're looking at here between the 1830s and 1840s is an incredible springboard of the railway becoming the communication system, the, the backbone, the industrial artery of the country. Uh, many people have said that the railway is the equivalent of the 19th century internet and uh, I, I think these early maps just show the, the exact veracity of that. 
Thank you very much. Now, the next uh, map, I love this one just because it's so confusing by modern standards. So everyone, when you look at this map, north is on the left and south is on the right. So if you look closely on the left hand side of the map, you will see Liverpool is over here with Birmingham over here on the right. So not the orientation we're used to at all. And this is a map of the Grand Junction Railway. And this is from a lovely book by a chap called Roscoe, who wrote a history of the line in the Victorian period. David and Anthony, what are we seeing here? What is the, the reason for this line going from A to B, from Manchester to Liverpool? Oh, from Birmingham to Liverpool, sorry. Well, the, the Liverpool and Manchester Railway, which was opened in 1830, is the first railway that co connects two big cities. Um, they weren't, strictly speaking, cities in those days, but that, that's effectively what they were. Liverpool, a great trading city. Now, we all know because of recent events where Liverpool's wealth came from. Manchester, the centre of the cotton industry. So they've been connected for a number of years. What the Grand Junction Railway does is connect that Liverpool Manchester artery with the English Midlands. Important to remember, of course, that Birmingham is on the brink now of becoming a railway nexus, but it had been a canal nexus for many years before that. So the Grand Junction Railway is circling its way into Birmingham and that's where it will meet the London and Birmingham Railway. So the north of England is very shortly going to be connected with the Midlands and with the metropolis. I think it's also um, very useful with this map to, to look and see at the bottom you have the gradient diagram showing you the exact way in which this is a true mainline railway engineered and surveyed by such names as Stevenson and Locke you know people whose names are engraved in the history of railway engineering but you can see it's a pretty straight line it's got easy curves and moderately easy gradients so you know it's a fast main line we have um, almost an obsession with speed in this country always have done because we want to get from a to b as quickly as possible um we are about moving goods but we're also about moving people and this is this is this is opening up um trade routes it's opening up um you know businessmen being able to see each other rather than take a stagecoach and taking days to get somewhere you can get between birmingham and liverpool in less than a day um It'll take a little bit longer to get to, to London directly, and I think that's uh, something that uh, the Curzon Street project shows quite vividly, is the fact that you know, Birmingham is a terminus station. They're not thinking about going through initially, so all trains have to come into Curzon Street. You have to change from Grand Junction to London and Birmingham to go down to the capital, but the potential is there. And you know, when you start to put those main lines together, then the connectivity is something very special and really you know, put, put, puts us on the cusp of, of creating that intercity network. Okay, it's not intercity at 100 mile an hour plus, but it's revolutionary compared to what you've had even five years before. Fascinating, thank you, Anthony. And I, I'm gonna come on to one of my, personally, one of my favorite images now. Uh, this is uh, a lovely and slightly bizarre extract from um, a children's alphabet book dated to 1845. And I think my, the opening line of this is, A is the arch, which you see when you start, that people pass under before they depart. And I understand that that's the railway arch at Euston Station, but I'm wondering, John, can you tell us why are we seeing these echoes of classical architecture in Victorian station buildings? Because as Emma alluded to, we're seeing a very, very similar thing at Curzon Street. Absolutely. Um, you're quite right. That is the, the famous Euston Arch that was sadly demolished in the 1960s. Um, and basically, classical architecture shows education and taste in this period. It shows you probably studied um, architecture and history. You may well have been on the Grand Tour and visited places like Greece and Italy. And you know, you're absorbing that classical world and you, you understand what you're showing. Um, the, the image in front of us now is the principal building as it was in the 1830s. Um, and it's also meant to be a counterpoint. You've got the Euston Arch in London and then at the Birmingham end, you've got something similarly monumental. It's very much an 
over-the-top statement of the, the prestige and the power of the railway, but also a celebration of the scale of this achievement. They actually compare building this railway to um, the, the, the Victorian equivalent of building the Great Pyramids at Giza in terms of you know, human, human endeavour. So it is really a, a way of wowing the audience. Thank you, John. And we, we've got a lovely etching here as well. And this particular etching shows um, the roof of the roundhouse we've been talking about. Now, uh, am I correct in thinking that the roof of the roundhouse changed substantially during its lifetime? Yes, absolutely. Um, it changed very quickly as well. The, the roof there is uh, from an engraving that was only seven or eight years after the roundhouse had actually opened. Um, but the roof has already been completely rebuilt um, so that the, the rotunda uh, was actually enclosed uh, with the, the addition of that belvedere on the top. Initially, it was open in the middle like a large ring donut. And is it likely that originally they'd have got quite wet while they were looking after the locomotives in there? Absolutely. And it's um, one of those strange mysteries of history as to why Stevenson designed it that way. Um, David, Anthony and I have been batting a few ideas out regarding why, and we're not sure whether it's something to do with the fact they burnt coke in this early era and uh, noxious fumes, but truthfully, we don't really know. It may just be that Stevenson wanted to keep it to the bare minimum and he didn't really mind um, the men getting wet, but he wanted to keep his locomotive safe. Fantastic, thank you. Now, I'm really happy that we can share with you today uh, something that's hot off from the studios of our, of our colleagues who do 3D design. So I'm going to show you now, um, I'm very happy to be able to show you, a, a 3D model of, uh, of the roundhouse at Curzon Street Station. Um, and I think probably the best person to talk us through this, and we're very lucky to have Tom from Visualising Heritage on the line as well. Tom, are you able to tell us, a, a, you know, how did you put this image together and, you know, what are we looking at here? Uh, so, yes, yeah, so this, this model is... Um based on the original plans from Stevenson. Uh, and I've basically used this as the, those plans is the basis to create this 3D model. Um, and it's quite simplified, so it shows you both um, roofs. Um, the one that Stevenson uh, originally proposed and then the one that was replaced with, which was just discussed earlier. Um, so yeah, so this is, um, a compilation of work where we've been recording the archaeology on site and this 3D model is based on the Stevenson's plans but drops straight onto the archaeology. There's only a probably a discrepancy of an inch or two in places um, so it's quite impressive how well um, this this model the plans actually matches what was built on site. Um, I've worked on quite a lot of industrial sites and it's quite a rarity to have this accuracy in the plan. So it's quite impressive. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much for um, sharing this with us, Tom. And I think what we can also do is we can pop this into the context of the archaeology um, and something else Tom has been able to do for us, which I'll just load up now, is pop that model on top of the archaeological remains. So I will share that now. So yes, so, so, so yes, so the below um, model um, is a, a model that we've produced um, via some laser scanning and some photogrammetry. So we've um, collected numerous positions where we've laser scanned it so you get a, an accurate um, 3D measurement and then combined that with photogrammetry where you're taking lots and lots of pictures and using the parallax in the pictures to create a 3D model and then they're blended together to get this um, very photorealistic and very accurate plan of what's actually on the ground. Um, so this was captured prior um, to the lockdown with COVID and hopefully we're going to go back and finish um, recording the rest of the site. And this model is produced from about 2,000 images. Um, so I take quite a lot very quickly. And Tom, can you just tell everyone, how do you mesh those photographs together? Um, so it, it, it's done in um, programs um, that, that process imagery. Uh, and it's, the whole process is called photogrammetry or structure for motion. 
and the structure for motion bit, the motion bit is me moving the camera. So if you imagine if you look um, at, if you hold up two fingers and look at them with one eye and then you move and look at them through the other eye, the relative position of your fingers will change. And it's the same thing as the computer will look at features in the images um, and use that and match and then try and reconstruct the the 3D structure from that. And as I said before, we combine this with laser scanning um, because purely the photographs don't get you the real size. So when you're processing data, um, we can get a very good 3D model, but it's not spatially accurate. So we have to then combine it with an, another measurement technique to actually get a 3D model that is accurate. And that's where we combine it with the laser scanning. Thank you very much for that, Tom. And I'm just going to pop on for everyone. Uh, we've got a nice little movie which will fly you through the model that Tom has made. So I will pop that on now. And Tom, just to say thank you again for sharing this with us, that's fantastic. And Anthony and David, I've got up Tom's uh, 3D photogrammetry image here of the site itself. And, I, you know, I'm a novice here. I'm looking at circles and rectangles on the ground. Can you help us understand what they are in a railway context? Well, what we're looking at here is um, a central turntable. Um, where the locomotives, once they'd finished their tour of duty, they would have been uncoupled from their trains, they would have been driven into this building, put on this turning platform in the middle of the building, which would then have been aligned so they could go on to one of the radiating tracks, which are evident here as the sites of the pits that would have been uh, installed between the rails. So you take the locomotive off the turntable onto a bit of track and then the driver and the fireman would have a look at it from underneath, check that all was well. They would have to remove the fire as well. So how that worked, we're not altogether certain. Uh, but it's not unlike um, a rotunda stable for horses. There were such things and I, I wondered if they might have been the immediate inspiration for Robert Stevenson. But that's what it does. It's a place to look after and, main, and uh, keep locomotives in running order between their turns of duty. And yeah, talking... I think you, the analogy. So the the analogy with the uh, the horses is particularly um, is particularly appropriate because, of course, you know these are known as iron horses and. Um, locomotives when they're put into the shed are referred to as being stabled and if you go across the the, the uh, Atlantic to the States um, those particular tracks coming radiating off the, turn, the turntable are known in the US still to this day as locomotive stalls so you know there's a real resonance there with with that uh, that, that horse horse transport now, we've talked a little bit about, you know, the station and the archaeology and getting it into context. And I think it would be remiss of us not to think about the locomotives as well. Um, so, 
Anthony, um, I'm going to ask you, can you tell us a little bit about the locomotives that we have seen at this time? Well, in the 1830s, you're still very much with the, uh, the, the Stevenson locomotives, the Payson T type and some of the others coming on. But what you have um, in, the, in, the, in the photograph on the screen is Columbine. Columbine dates from 1845 and is the first locomotive constructed by the Grand Junction Railway at their crew works. It's known as the crew type. Um, this is 15 years after Stevenson's rocket and the opening of the Liverpool Manchester Railway, but the DNA of Rocket comes through into this machine. It's got the, all the technical features that uh, were to be in locomotives for another 115 years after that. But we won't go into that now, but say this is called the crew type, particularly because of the way that it's it, the, the, the ingredients of the engine come together. Between 1830 and, uh, and, and the early 1840s, a, a lot of the working parts of steam locomotives, the cylinders, the valve gear, the motion, were put underneath and they were driving a thing called a crank axle. Now, a crank axle is quite an intricate piece of engineering, and there's a lot of um, stuff that can go wrong with it. Crank axles broke, uh, occasionally still do break with, uh, with heritage machinery. And so um, the engineers, uh, Alan and Budicom, got together and put all the working bits, the steam cylinders on the outside of, um, of Columbine. So that's the steam cylinders you can see at the front of the engine there connected by a rod to the six foot driving wheel. And the crew type by Alan and Budicom was made not only in the UK, but was made by Budicom in, in France. Uh, there is a, a surviving crew type locomotive in the museum at Mulhouse. And this is a passenger version. So it's uh, it's got a six foot driving wheel. They also made goods engine versions, which had four driving wheels. So it was two, four, 240 wheel arrangement if you're into that sort of thing. So Columbine, sorry, yeah, Columbine is a 222, um, but the the goods engines were 240s, and uh, they, they they set the scene for locomotive development for a good couple of decades because they worked so well. And what in particular made them work so well? well you can it also see speed. And it was in simplicity and ease of maintenance. Um, we drew the analogy earlier with, with horses, um, and horses obviously need attention, and so does the iron horse. Um, if you can minimise wear and tear, um, you are thus reducing your costs. Um, the, the fact that you've got everything on the outside is acce it's, it's accessible, you can get to it. Um, the reliability of the engine through not having a crank axle, that's improved. Um, they're easy to work on or much easier to work on uh, and they get on with the job and they do the job well. Um, what I think is also something that, that, that we need to show and bring out in comparison to a, a lot of locomotives that um, people will be familiar with today is the complete and utter absence of a cab. Um, all you have at the back end for the driver and fireman is, uh, is what's called a weatherboard. Or a, a spectacle plate which has the two windows in facing forward with those brass rims. Again, we speculated that cabs were not um, enjoyed by many people because of the, the coke firing and the fumes. Um, but also, the, some locomotive engineers in the 19th century regarded the cab as uh, unhealthy and, and a, uh, a worthless frippery. Um, one of the later engineers suggesting that a stout Macintosh was all that was required for a crew rather than, uh, than, than a cab. Um, you also come across lots of photographs of proud engine men with their steeds and they've all got big beards. And well, I suppose that saves you buying a scarf or a muffler. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a useful engine. It does the job and it, it did the job well for the directors of the Grand Junction Railway and later the London Northwestern Railway. The, the fact that it survives to this day, uh, it gives us a, a, a very rare window into the locomotive design of the mid 19th century because so few engines of this period survived because they were all worn out. And certainly you know, in the 1860s, 1870s, this was no more than a piece of industrial plant. There was no place for um, enthusiasm, wistfulness, nostalgia. And so when a machine finished its working life, it was discarded, recycled, and a new engine took its place. And Columbine is a particularly 
interesting survivor. It's a unique survivor. It's a fascinating survivor for those of us studying locomotive technology of that period. And I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pop on a short video of Columbine so people can see all around the locomotive. And Anthony, while it's playing, if you do um, unmute yourself, you'll be able to pass some comments as well. I think the other thing with Columbine as we go around it is that to, we're not known for, for fripperies, but um, it's, it's got a few niceties around the edges that just give it that, that, that appeal when you, when you look at it. The uh, large wheel on the side, the driving wheel, is covered by a splasher because uh, it was deemed that it would be offensive. It's a bit like uh, a, a lady showing her underskirt for a, a locomotive to show its wheels above the platform as, as it arrives at the station. Um, but nonetheless, you know, it's a very elegant looking engine. It's of its time. Uh, it's great that we have it to be able to, to study in such detail now. And uh, of course, there it is in the situation where it may have been at Curzon Street some time ago. And Anthony, am I right in thinking it's at the National Science Museum now? It is. It's at the uh, Science Museum in South Kensington, yes. But it's part of the National Railway Museum collection, and we we are part of the Science Museum group, so uh, it still comes under our remit. Fantastic. And now we've got um, a few more images from Roscoe's book here. Um, so this was a, Ros a book by a chap called Roscoe, written in 1839, which rather fantastically titled "The Book of the Grand Junction Railway: The History of the Line from Birmingham to Liverpool and Manchester." Uh, are these images romanticised, or, or is this what? Uh, we can imagine a, a 19th century railway to look like. I don't think they're very far off the mark. Um, I think we're meant to see here change and continuity, aren't we? You know, if you look at the right, there's the church in a grove of trees, um, but there are factories in the background, decently shielded, rather like Columbine's driving wheel. Um, so you've you've got the old world here, but you've also got the new world of factories and commerce and you've got this reasonably convincing depiction of a train of the period so a locomotive that's perhaps just the immediate design ancestor of columbine and um, of course a train of four wheel carriages um, you, you didn't have the long articulated carriages that you travel in these days same sort of themes emerging here um, except that i think the past is emphasized more um, the church, but the train as well. And um, am I imagining it, or can we see luggage on the roof of the carriages? I think you can. And would that have been standard practice? Fairly common, yes. yes. Um, American <laughs> railroads actually let people uh, travel on the roofs of the, the carriages, uh, but British and Irish ones tended to forbid that because there were more low bridges. Uh, but they certainly, some of them carried luggages, luggage on the, the carriage roofs. Yes, because bear in mind that these carriages are a lot smaller, they're a lot shorter in, in height than uh, the, the current vehicles that we're used to. And of course, the, the term the railway guard, I mean, we come, we, we've got used to conductors these days on the, on the 21st century railway. But the guard is the guard of the train, but he's the guard of, he is guarding the, the, good, the goods, not just the passengers, he's guarding them physically. And uh, guarding them from what, presumably crime or? Well, from, from crime, from fire, I mean, the engines are chucking out cinders and ashes every so often. It's not unknown for, for goods to be lost due to, uh, you know, a conflagration on the move. And, um, yeah, you, you, you also, say you're not far away from the days of the stagecoach when, um, when, when, when robbery is rife. In a sense, those carriages are still stagecoaches on railway wheels to some extent. And are we seeing a similar kind of lineage of design from the stagecoaches into the carriages? 
very much so. Yes, we do. Um, the the yeah. Innovative Railway Carriages were designed by stagecoach builders, and um, they, they were basically three stagecoach bodies mounted on the one underframe. So many of the assumptions, just as with the horse stable for the locomotive shed from horse days, do pass into the railway age. Fantastic. Thank you very much indeed for that, chaps. So, um, everyone on the line, this is now your opportunity to ask some questions. Uh, so, we've had a few questions coming already, but if there's other things that have stirred your thoughts whilst we've been talking, do type them in the question box and we have all the right experts here to answer your questions as we go along. And I think uh, the question I'd like to start with, Emma, is possibly one for you actually is just to expand a little more on that difference between digging in industrial archaeology and rural archaeology. Yep, that's a really fantastic question. So often when we discuss archaeology we talk about positive and negative features. So a positive feature is something that comes up from the ground, whereas a negative feature will be perhaps a ditch or a pit where we have to dig down below ground level to excavate it and get the profile. So that's kind of one of the two main differences. Um, industrial archaeology, as you can see, so, sorry, as you could see rather from some of the images, you are surrounded by, by people and buildings. And when we dig through those layers, often through a layer of concrete, then perhaps made ground. So made ground is often the um, demolition rubble and detritus, which is used to level the air before we build again. We dig down and we'll find perhaps bits of pottery or maybe uh, clay pipes from kind of ev every era. So as we go down stratigraphically um, through the, the rubble and the bricks, we do hopefully find uh, some bricks that actually are part of a structure or a wall. The way that we then record them is vastly different because with the, whereas rural archaeology, we talk about um, the different fills and deposits and the shape of the ditch, if it was concave or convex, when we're looking at walls and structures, we want to know what phasing it has. So you want to know what the, the brick bonding pattern is. Is it stretcher bond, header bond? Is it Dutch bond or Flemish? All these different brick types and styles. The way the brick wall looks will give us an indication of what that wall might have been used for. So if we're digging on the ground and don't have those maps, the way the wall is built can give us so much information. Um, whereas if you're looking at a ditch, we will perhaps be wanting to find if there's more than one fill in it. Does it look like the ditch held water or has it been backfilled with rubbish? So it's a it's a change in style of recording and also um, often a huge change in time period as well. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, a lovely question from Sybil and David. I think this one's probably for you. Who were these passengers on early railways? Um, you know, were they everyday people? Were they working class? Were, you know, who were they? Well, that's a very good question. And I think that um, you know, the, the engraving we're looking at here shows some very decidedly middle class types traveling by train. Now, I don't think you'd have had many people from very poor backgrounds traveling on the Grand Junction or the London and Birmingham in its early days. And the reason I'm saying that is that you wouldn't have had the commuter traffic from suburbs that you'd have had before. So I think they were mainly the well-heeled merchants, uh, professional people um, who were making the journey between these cities in the early days. Uh, but increasingly, I think um, people from less well-off backgrounds were becoming accustomed to travel by train. Fantastic, thank you very much. And uh, Rosie is asking, and I think Anthony, this is a, te a technical question for you. What was the gauge of the track at Curzon Street? Did it match up with the gauge of tracks all across the country? And at what point did uh, the country decide on having a standard gauge throughout the UK? Well, the gauge issue was a very hot one through the 1830s, um, 1840s. The, the Stevensonian gauge, what became known as the standard gauge of four feet, eight and a half inches. And don't ask me that in metric, because I can't quite remember, like 1435 millimetres. Um, it was establishing itself as the standard by then. But you do have people trying to build railways to different gauges because they 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 reckon that uh, that the, the trains will be 
more stable, um, faster, able to carry more. And of course, the most famous version of that is uh, is, is Brunel and his broad gauge, which was seven feet and one quarter inch. Uh, the Great Western Railway, uh, Great Western Railway uh, incorporated in 1835 and opened a couple of years after that. Um, but that, by then, it's already too late for the, the for this, the different gauges to uh, be able to coexist side by side. Um, certainly, the, you know, the Grand Junction Railway and the, the London and Birmingham are both four feet eight and a half inches. The uh, Liverpool Manchester Railway, which they connect to, is four feet eight and a half inches. So it's beginning to have a network of that standard gauge. So anything else is becoming to, is, is becoming uh, abnormality. And you do have five feet gauge railways, five feet three, five feet six, six foot gauge, uh, a few railways of sub four feet eight and a half. There's one in Dartmoor, the Leemore Railway is four feet six inches. You're nominally around that four foot eight and a half. But there is, uh, there is a gauge commission that was set up during the, uh, the 19th century establish uh, which would be the worst sorry which would be the most suitable uh, for the network to be developed upon because you, you come across uh, incredible scenes where there is a change of gauge places like Gloucester um, where not only people but goods have to be transshipped from one side one railway gauge to the other uh, there is a, a very fine preserved example of uh, a transfer shed a broad gauge transfer shed at the Didcot railway centre in Oxfordshire um, I think it is unique by now being able to show how exactly that worked. So it's, it's covered over with a platform between it and everything on the train has to be moved from one side to the other. It's terribly inconvenient. It's double handling of goods. The passengers complain. And so the Gage Commission you know, it's during the, in the middle to the latter part of the 19th century finds in favour of this, the, the, the standard gauge, the four feet, eight and a half inches. Uh, but the broad gauge itself is not obsolete until um, the early 1890s, the, the, the final um, eradication of the seven foot broad gauge. And even then you find that there are different gauges still in other applications, such as light railways, narrow gauge railways, um, many of the, the narrow gauge railways of, of, of Wales or uh, the English Midlands, all us underneath four feet, eight and a half inches, they're two foot gauge, but they're more on a sort of local scale and built for uh, cheapness of cost and ease of engineering. But the British national network is is and remains four feet, eight and a half inches. And that's, that standard is set from around this time, really. That's a brilliant answer. Thank you so much for that, Anthony. Um, we've got a question uh, now from um, who's asking this. We've got a question from Elizabeth. Um, Emma, I think this is probably one for you. Um, Elizabeth's asking, aside from the roundhouse, do we have evidence for any other buildings on site as yet? Yeah, so um, at, at the moment, um, we're, uh, we're still writing up the, the main report uh, for the results here and Tom mentioned that there we are ho hoping to go back um, once it's safe to do so in light of coronavirus but in, in terms of what we're kind of finding on site we've got some of those um, earlier turntables so if you were if you can Sam if you can go back to um, those last four slides we've got um, two of the turntables that the goods turntable and one of the um, Grand Junction Railway turntables we also have um, elements of the uh, former platform as well. Um, so we've got, um, I think if you can scroll perhaps, I think forward, Sam, there's one of the, yeah, fantastic, that's per, oh, just, just the other one there with the stanchion. Sorry, guys. That's all right. There we go. Perfect. Yeah, brilliant. So we'll we'll see remains like this on site, um, and then we'll use some of the earlier maps to try and overlay uh, those survey images. As Tom said, this site has one of the most incredible levels of matching the survey data to the original maps of the time. So many different sites that I've worked on with industrial archaeology, you never get that kind of image snapped together. So it's a really unique site that we do have it here. Uh, so yeah, parts of the platform, um, we've got parts of the, the good station as well. Um, so yeah, we've got kind of whispers and echoes of loads of different parts of the archaeology on site. That's brilliant. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, and John, um, a question I think for you as well. Um, in terms of what we're seeing on site at the moment, what is the, the future of the archaeology there? 
Um, well, that's that's an interesting question. Um, it's still under discussion, really, um, because as you can imagine, it's a very complex site, um, and we're trying to um, unpick what's the best way to preserve and, and mitigate against any any impacts from building our new railway. So um, there's no definitive answer at the moment, but watch this space. That's brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. That does just about conclude all the questions uh, we've got time for this afternoon. So I want to say a massive thank you to everyone for joining us and a huge thank you to all our experts. Um, it's been a real pleasure and it's been really nice for Emma and I to talk a little bit beyond ancient archaeology and look at you know, more recent archaeology. So thank you very, very much for joining us. We do absolutely appreciate your feedback. So after the session, you will receive an email. And in that email, there'll be a link to um, this survey. And if you can fill in the survey, tell us what you enjoyed, tell us what we could improve. That helps us know what we do. So when we do future sessions like this, we can keep bringing you the latest updates and the latest finds and also our latest interpretation of the archaeology that HS2 is revealing. So massive thanks to the National Railway Museum. Um, Anthony, thank you. Um, to David, thank you for joining us. Um, also thanks to Molar Archaeology, who provided some of the images. Um, we've used a lot of photos and maps from the National Railway Museum and the Science Museum Group. And of course, Tom, thank you so much for your reconstructions and photogrammetry um, created through visualising heritage. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy your afternoons and stay safe. Cheerio now. Goodbye. <laughs>